In today's video, we'll be taking a look at one of William Shakespeare's greatest ever love poems. Welcome to a reading, summary, and analysis of Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be air and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. So if you've ever seen any of my past videos, you know that I think it's incredibly important to know what every word of a poem means, especially a short non-narrative poem. So here's some definitions that might help you out if you're unfamiliar with them. There's also some confusing phrases. We'll be getting into those in more detail in just a little bit. Okay, so in this first sentence, there's some interesting things going on. I don't want to rush past the very first line and thus title of the poem, Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds. I think this is such an interesting turn of phrase for a modern reader because we associate love so much with the heart, and of course Shakespeare does have a lot of heart-based imagery, but he also has a lot of mind-based imagery when it comes to talking about love. One of the lines that springs to my mind is from Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1, when Ophelia is lamenting Hamlet's seeming fall into madness, and she says, Oh, what a noble mind is here or thrown. So yeah, even though falling in love is such an emotional feeling, remaining in love really has a lot to do with an individual's mind. And that can be a great thing to keep in mind, keep in mind, with this poem, because this is a poem not about falling in love, but love enduring. And that becomes very evident in these next images that I have, or turns of phrase that I have highlighted in yellow. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. So you have all of these sort of binaries, these opposites working here that there's choices, love or not love. Alter when you have the opportunity or don't. Remove when someone or something is trying to remove an individual from a relationship or not. Interestingly enough, the first sentence of this poem is not about what love is, but what love is not and it is not something that changes easily. So in the second sentence of this poem, we're told what love is. And we get this nautical image here. We have ever fixed mark, which is the star that's referred to, and the tempest is why the bark or ship is wandering. So a ship lost at sea because of a storm, but it saw a star once, and it's fixed on that mark, hoping it will take it to safety. We don't know how love will turn out, but we have faith and hope that it will endure. So much like this wandering ship has to have faith in that mark. This line in purple here is a somewhat ambiguous line, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. A couple different interpretations. I've heard people talk about this just in a very practical sense of love. So height be taken is measurable, so you can measure a person, right, like their occupation, their looks. But the worth of their love is unknown when you enter a relationship. It's something that needs to play out. I think that's a wonderful reading of the line, but it's not super accurate to the context of the poem. The his be taken is most likely referring to the star. So a star being measured in the sky. So the worth of the star, whether or not it will lead you to safety is unknown, but you can measure the star in the sky, which really fits with the nautical term. The very first time I read this line, I thought it had something to do with the ship's height. So we didn't know what was worthy about the ship or what was in the ship that made it so worthwhile, but its height was taken like the waves were above its height. So the reason I bring that up is not to confuse you, but to let you know that poetry is a little ambiguous. And like all art, poetry isn't about finding the right answer all the time or the exact right answer. I don't have all the right answers and that's okay. That's kind of the fun of art. So it makes it different from other disciplines. 
Okay, moving on, this third sentence, super interesting because we have these repeated phrases here. We have bending, which goes up with bends, and alters with alteration. So again, we're told what love is not. Love is not time's fool. And time is personified here. You could think father time, or maybe grim reaper would be a little more useful for a modern reader. So though rosy lips and cheeks, the things that are marks of youth and beauty, do bend under time's sickles compass, and compass here means circular motion. It's also interesting, compass is a very nautical phrase, like we saw earlier in the poem. So even though everyone, whether they're in love or not, grows old, and the stereotypical things that make us beautiful on the outside wither away and change, love doesn't alter. It does have to bend with time, but it doesn't alter in these brief hours and weeks that we're alive, but rather bears it out to the edge of doom. And bears is such a fantastic verb, because when you think of bearing something, you think of work. And truly, that's what enduring love is. It is the work of the mind to remain in love, to stay strong with that person, to put love above the things that could break you out of it. Because even though the things that end relationships can be impulsive, they are still conscious decisions. Falling in love doesn't really feel that conscious. Sure, you weigh things up in your mind, but it is a very emotional, almost falling feeling, right? Like you almost can't help it. But to remain in love for 50, 60, however many years, I imagine that requires a lot of conscious thought and decisions to put that relationship above, you know, alternatives. And then in the final couplet, it's a Shakespearean sonnet, so it ends in a couplet. If this be air and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. We have Shakespeare really laying it all out here for us in terms of the validity of these words. If this is false, I never wrote, nor no man ever loved. And I want to focus on that I never wrote part. I never writ is what it says, but wrote. You know, I consider myself a writer. I write poems in my free time. I write some plays every now and then, about one a year. But I'm no Shakespeare, and I'm not even just talking like talent-wise. I'm not Shakespeare. Like, I've not put in the time that Shakespeare put into writing. If you look at how long he wrote and the number of plays and poems he produced, like, this man lived, breathed, and ate writing. I write, but I also didn't leave my family to go to London and focus on it. <laughs> and I teach most of the day, and I direct or coach and I make YouTube videos, and I play video games, and I run. And it's not that Shakespeare didn't do anything else, but he's very focused on writing. And you see that a lot with the writers that made the Elizabethan and the Jacobean eras so incredible. Uh, ben Jonson, in the heartbreaking poem uh, On My First Son, where he talks about losing his first son, compares his son to his best piece of poetry. Well, he calls his son his best piece of poetry, better than anything he wrote. And I think that puts it into context just how much Shakespeare is putting on the line to say that I've never written anything if this is false. Now, this is the speaker. This isn't necessarily Shakespeare. I understand that. But I think with that context, it, it makes it very interesting. The next thing we should talk about, I mentioned it's a sonnet. Uh, here's the rhyme scheme for you. I did not mark the meter of this sonnet. It's actually breaks from iambic pentameter all the time and there's a lot of interpretation depending on how you read these words especially how they might have been read in Shakespeare's time. So I found this fantastic write-up on the meter of this poem that I'll link to in the description because I could try and summarize it for you but I think this writer is doing a much much better job. Um, really in-depth analysis of the poem. I don't actually agree with the final conclusion but the way they got to that conclusion is definitely worth a read, especially if you want to learn more about meter. So what my recommendation would be, try and find the meter on your own first and see how yours compares with this individual's. Not saying theirs is the only way to read it, but um, in terms of sonnets, I haven't found one that breaks iambic pentameter quite as frequently or as interestingly as this one, Shakespearean sonnets anyway. So that is Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds. Let me know what you think. Is this a worthwhile interpretation of love? I find it quite moving and inspiring, but I also think there's other views on this. I'm reminded of uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay's wonderful sonnet, What Lips My Lips Have Kissed and Where and Why, where she compares, the speaker compares herself to a tree now that all of love has left her life. And she says, I don't know what's happened to me, paraphrasing here, but I know summer sang in me once, 
that in me sings no more. The love, even if it ends, because all love ends eventually, is still worthwhile. Even if it's only a year, even if it's only a couple months, it doesn't mean it wasn't love and it certainly doesn't mean it was worthless. But I do think there's something to be said about true love being love that endures beyond the things that might break lesser feelings. Anyway, that's my take on it. Love to hear your questions and comments uh, down below. Thank you so much for watching and happy reading.